Uh, in the uh, back half of the hour, Jason Huffman from Americans for Prosperity. Right now, we want to say good morning to the superintendent of schools in Berkeley County, Dr. Ryan Sachs. Good to see you, sir. It's great to be here as always. Wonderful to have you uh, along the way here. And uh, speaking of schools at Martinsburg High School, the volleyball team is doing a raffle. Dylan has the graphic, I think. Is it handy there? Yeah, pop it up there. You can bid on these things. It's a fundraiser for the volleyball team there. And you go to our TV10 Facebook page. I think there's already a bid for $100 on this gift basket so you can check it out and see everything that's in there and have a, a bid and maybe it's yours it all raises money i believe for the volleyball team at martin spring high school which would fall under your purview as they are students in berkeley county and uh, also i think the ssac playoff pairings came out yesterday dr Sachs. you were saying so we're kind of mm-hmm. back on for high school football this weekend uh, it sounds like it yeah absolutely we're back on yeah i think dylan has those graphics too if you can pop those up on the screen. That's the quad A right there, which all of the Eastern Panhandle six high schools in Berkeley and Jefferson County are quad A. So everything kind of feeds off of that sheet right there that you see on your TV screen. Martinsburg one, Spring Mills two, and uh, I see Hedgesville the 15, Washington is the nine, Musselman is the uh, 13, and Jefferson is the three. So that's pretty good. You got the one, two, and the three there, Dylan. And uh, what's uh, what's our kickoff uh, for our first game this weekend, Dylan? What are we doing? Uh, it's looking like everyone but Washington in the Eastern Panhandle plays on Friday. Well, actually, I believe Jefferson plays uh, as well on Saturday afternoon. So we should have the Martinsburg game uh, Friday night against Parkersburg. Uh, I think there might still be maybe like a little bit of uncertainty that these are official uh, times and days, but as far as we know, uh, so Jeff, I don't think we have an official, you know, locked in a hundred percent if we're, if we're doing or what we're doing mm-hmm. Saturday, but uh, <clears throat> Martinsburg Friday night at the very least. Oh, okay. Very good. And, by the way, that Parkersburg matchup, I think our TV 10 is frozen, by the way, Dylan, too, by the way. Uh, that Parkersburg matchup, first time Martinsburg made the finals in 3A, their opponent was Parkersburg. Dr. Sachs, yesterday we had in studio the two board members, the leadership of the school board, um, Jackie Long, the president, most power, the uh, vice president, and we got into talking about SBA funding. And I don't want to steal Bill's question, so I'm going to hand it off to Bill here because I know he had a lot of questions yesterday for for Jackie and Melissa about SBA funding. And I thought they did a very good job, but something that I question that still lingers in my mind, last year we asked for $25 million. Yes. And our needs, as everybody recognizes, have not gone down. We still have pressing needs. We don't have enough school buildings. We still use modular units. You know, go down the list. This year we asked for four million dollars, mm-hmm. why did we not ask for a more robust number? I and before you say that the other parts of states need some, need to circulate around. Sure, everybody needs some. Everybody needs some. But That's our right. our needs, I think, because of such a growth county, is are quite unique. So why do we not ask for more money? Well, I think to be completely honest with you, part of it's strategy, uh, because you are dealing with. Um, Obviously, a competitive nature of these grant awards. The SBA only has $55 million annually to allocate uh, to the, their projects. I think that they, they have something like $250 million in requests and only $55 million to, to, to um, allocate. Um, so thinking about uh, the nature of the requests we've had in the past and the awards that we've received. So the projects that we are currently under underway right now are bond projects and when the school district went to the sba uh, last year and asked for the 25 million it was um as part of the deal with the bond that if the bond passes then will the sba fund us 25 million dollars in looking at our request this year you know um, we recognize that when the bond plan was put together our enrollment has exceeded projections from that time. And so when we look at some of these buildings that were projected to house, you know, uh, 300 students, for example, well, we recognize that if, if when that school opens up on day one, we're not gonna have enough classrooms because we've already exceeded our enrollment expectation from that time. And so going back to the SBA and saying, hey, as part of our bond project, we need, we need more money. Um, we have to be very, 
we have to be very um, intentional with why it is that we need more money to help with the bond project specifically. So the Inwood project being a bond project, you know, we planned originally for eight classrooms, we need 12. So the the rationale and the nexus as to why are we only asking for four million is because that's what it's gonna to take to add the additional classrooms to the Inwood project that we need to address um, overcrowding in, in some of our other schools and to bring all those pre-K classrooms to the Inwood site. And, and you know, the, the fact is, is that we're going to need to be able to um, update our, our comprehensive facility plan because of the growth that we have to make sure that the community understands that after these bond projects are completed, we have these next projects that we feel are gonna be important. And having the community's input on what those projects are gonna look like, um, a, a, a new high school in the, in the southern end of the county, another intermediate school, uh, um, uh, I think really in my heart, I think we have to be able to do something for Hedgesville Middle School and you know providing an updated facility for them. And so making sure that as we think about the next ask that we're going to make for the SBA, it's going to be larger. But right now, it's very, it's very intentional that we're asking for a $4 million match with what they've already done for $25 million for our bond projects as a, as a whole. The other thing is, is that when you go to the SBA, uh, my experience has taught me that one of the things they look at is they look to see how much skin in the game the school district has in their, in their, their ask. And projects that are um, where the ratio is more heavily on the district than it is the SBA um, do seem to get greater weight. So with the Inwood project asking for four million and we're putting in you know twelve million, um, comparatively speaking to the other other requests that are out there, there's a lot of other people that are asking for eighty, ninety, sometimes a hundred percent. We're asking for more like a twenty-five uh, percent match. Okay. Yeah, you explained very well for this this year four million dollars. Let's bounce to next year. Sure. Are we still within the the bond tenure during next year? And are we do we have the same restrictions next year that we had this year? No, I don't think so because by the time that we get to next year, we will have all of our bond projects underway, uh, contracts approved, moving dirt, walls going up. It'll be it'll be what the, the the next project needs to be outside the bond that we would really go to the SBA and ask for funding for, I think. Okay, and uh, uh, which is reassuring. Uh, but the point that you made, skin in the game with, uh, with district funding, the fact that it's going to be outside of the bond, does that mean we may be at a slight disadvantage over what we were last year because we did have a lot of skin in the game last year? Well, we still have a lot of skin in the game this year because yeah. it's about the project itself. It's not about the totality of the and, bond. But dollars coming into the, uh, I'm talking, talking about uh, district funding. I'm not talking about district needs, district funding. Will we be at a disadvantage next year? Oh, next year. Yeah. Well, I think I think we we have not identified what project we would be yeah. looking at. We need to look at the CEFP and say, okay, what's the next project on the list? And, and I do think that probably before that time, uh, there's going to need to be some community involvement in saying, hey, look, here's what the CEFP says that we need to do. Um, do we still agree with that? Because again, our enrollment has changed so, so much since the CEP was originally done. And even the amendment that was done in 2022, that um, I think we need, we need to sort of have a, a refresh with the community and our stakeholders to say, this is this is what we've said we're going to do. Do we all still agree that this is the direction we need to move? And from that, we will decide what is the project we're going to we're going to request. How much money do we have that we can put toward our from our local funding? Um, and 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 maybe um, you know uh, there we have to look at every funding source that we can have that yeah. would be local. Um, but obviously the bond dollars won't be there, but we still want to come up with a competitive request. Let me squeeze in one more quick, quick question before John takes over. Uh, how many counties have school bonds? I, I don't, I honestly don't know the answer to that. I a think gut feeling a half. Oh, a no, no, I would say, um, I would say maybe, you know, current, current active construction bond projects that are out there right now, I, I would say maybe less than five. Okay. Um, school districts that have bonds that have already built and they're still making the, the debt payment, I, I would say it's probably roughly, you know, maybe, maybe half. Yeah. yeah. Okay. And that's, and that's a, 
that is not that's that's not an educated guess. That's that's more of like a sure. an, anecdotal I guess. Understand that's so, fair. Yeah. yeah. Okay. John, um, as we build more schools, we're going to need more teachers. I hear we still have a problem retaining teachers that we have. How are we going? What's what's the formula there? Well, I think that uh, one of the things that, that there is a silver lining, and that is is that this past year we were able to have less long-term subs than we've had in the past, at least for, for, uh, over last year. Um, so I meaning think our, what? Meaning that we were able to fill them with full-time uh, certified people uh, without having to not have it filled and have to have a long-term sub that, that is put in that position. Um, so I think that what that means is, is that we've been doing a better job of recruiting people to come and, and fill our classroom needs uh, with certified folks or people that are on an alternative path. Uh, they may have an undergraduate uh, degree that is you know commensurate with what we need, but we're going to help them get their teaching certi uh, certification. Um, so I think we're, we're, we're moving in the right direction. I think that uh, our recruitment efforts, our ground game, you know, is relentless um, with different uh, hiring events. Uh, we, we had a hiring event just uh, several weeks ago at the, uh, at the board office, and um, I, I want to say that we had something like 50 or 60 folks that came in to apply. Um, obviously, the need is, is still there. And so when we think about retaining those folks, though, that's the, that's the magic right there is, is how do you retain them, especially with the competitive uh, uh, salary landscape that we have in the area? One is, is I think we have to be relentless in making sure we're looking at our budget to make sure that we are uh, compensating our employees as fairly as we can with the resources that we have. But second to that, I think is also very important is, is that we have a culture of respect and, and support for our educators so that when they're in our classrooms, they're in our school buildings, that they see and they feel that they are being supported through high quality professional development um, leadership, leadership opportunities, career advancement, um, uh, a sense of belonging, a sense of purpose. You know, I think that when you have a positive culture, it's a whole lot easier for people to say, you know what, I, I want to stay because I feel like my why is here. Um, but those can't be the only things. It's, it's really a, it's a big recipe where we have to have all the right ingredients. And when we think about it, it, it is very difficult to say well we're just going to address this by salary alone so it's a big part of the it's a big part of the equation but there's other parts of it that are equally as important and that's supporting our educators has there been a fundamental change in recruitment strategy um i i, I wouldn't say that there's been a fundamental change in recruitment strategy other than the fact that um working with our hr team that we want to be able to have more opportunities that are available throughout the year to hire as opposed to just hiring during certain parts of the year. I want to ask you, Dr. Sachs, about attendance because I understand this has become an issue recently. Mm -hmm. uh, not that it's new, um, but it's become uh, an issue recently because there's been some changes in West Virginia code that have defined more clearly what an excused absence is for a school day. Mm -hmm. Can you address that and some of the concerns of the parents who might not have been aware of these changes? Yeah, so uh, the, the legislature uh, made some changes to um, the attendance coding system where we had a multitude of different um, reasons why we could, you know, how we could code absences and some of those were excused, unexcused, et cetera. And they really, what they did is they condensed them and they reduced them so that mm -hmm. there's only a few codes that we have uh, to be able to, it really, I think, apply some consistency to it. I think the other thing that was um, experienced is, is that there was a, the attendance code for uh, leave of educational value, um, you know, was somewhat being um, abused throughout the, throughout the state. And so while that was removed altogether, um, that policy was not actually approved by the state board until just recently. So we were monitoring it. We were looking to see how those 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 um, codes were going to evolve and the guidance from the Department of Education. And so as soon as we were aware of that, then we had a responsibility to update our own policy in the county and to advise our families, which unfortunately was well after the school year started. And and so I understand and I can sympathize as a parent myself. I can I can sympathize learning something different, after, especially after you made plans. But however, I, oh, go, go ahead. No, please go. No, I was going to say. However, I think it's very important that we that I mention that you know families have to do what's best for them and their, their their situation and if you've made plans to do something 
with your children, and it is that it is enrichment. It is uh, something that that you know strengthens the family, or it's something the family needs to do because it's it's important to you. You know, we're not taking students or families to truancy court because of a vacation. It's just not going to happen. Um, you know, I think that um, now that families know that that there is no longer by the state's al- uh, uh, allowance leave for educational value for a, for a trip or, or what have you, um, they can plan in the future for that. But those things that have already been, have already occurred or that are, have already been planned or approved. Well, again, we're not going to, we're not going to hold, uh, families to, uh, an unfair, um, stipulation. And, and again, they have to do what's best for them. And so, um, and honestly, the, the attendance issue across the state is not because of, uh, a family that's taking one family trip. It's about the it's about the systemic absences that a student may have that accumulate within the 180 days of instruction that take away from um, the opportunities for that student to have class seat time and or or opportunities to build skills so that they can be successful. The code is 18-8-4 in effect. Since June 7 of 2024, these are the excused absences. Medical or dental appointment with a written excuse from a physician or dentist. Personal illness or injury of the student or of a student's family member, limited to 10 per year. Death in the family. Judicial obligation or court appearance. Military requirement for students enlisted or enlisting in the military. Is there a number of unexcused absences that would cause you to hold a student back a grade, Dr. Sachs? Uh, I, I think that there's a multitude of things that whenever you're talking about holding a student back, I mean, it, it's really about, um, mat, you know, attainment of the skills ne- necessary for that grade level. And so, you know, there's, there's, a, there's parent input, there's the teacher input, um, there's uh, what skills have they mastered. Um, so I, I don't think it's, it's attendance is going to be a primary indicator. It's going to be what the, what the student has been able to exhibit that they've learned and mastered over the course of the year. So, Bill, how much flexibility you as a superintendent or the school board have in deviating from this the policy of unexcused absences? Specifically, you mentioned earlier you did not want to disrupt some changes uh, that a family had. If a vacation was planned, uh, could you do you have the prerogative to excuse that? In, on a unique by unique basis by basis, I don't think that we have the authority to supersede state code or state policy. What I'm saying is, is that when we have within our timelines of uh, unexcused absences and the and the measures that we take or the interventions that we take to notify families that you know you missed X number of days and you know we want to work with you to have positive attendance. It's, it's really those metrics that, that I think we have to evaluate when we know that a family has had an experience where they've taken their kids on a, on a family trip that was educationally en- enriching and so on and so forth. I, I think that's part of the, that's part of the discovery con- uh, conversation that the school and the families have to make sure that this is not going to, you know, the attendance is not habitual. And I, I would also further state that let's say that they've gotten to the the metric where normally um, we would have to, you know, because they've missed so many days uh, of school so far that that n- under normal situations we would need to pursue uh, some sort of court action. We're not gonna we're not gonna be t- taking a look at the f- the four or five days or the three or four days that someone went on a vacation and saying, well, we're gonna hold this. This is yeah. part of the this is part of our rationale. That's not really what it's going to be about. We're talking about families that that or students that are missing, you know, an exceptional number of days outside of a uh, a one-off family trip. Somewhere. Chronic absenteeism. Yeah, we're back. Chronic to... absenteeism, and that's really what the root of what I think that, that the legislature is trying to address, and what the Department of Education is trying to address. And to be honest with you, it's what we're trying to address. We we want to make sure that that uh, we are being very intentional with making sure that. Um, student learning opportunities within our schools are are there and it, and we can't do that when students are gone we're about to run out of time but in previous times with us you mentioned how pleased you are with the cell phone cell phone policy mm-hmm. are you still satisfied the way it's going 
Yeah, absolutely. I, um, I'll be honest with you. Um, even even now, when I talk to students, and uh, not all students are obviously all in favor of it, but I would say a majority of the students that I speak with are very pleased because they feel like they have improved relationships with their peers during the school day because uh, there are interactions that can take place. Good, John. And and again, with on short time, the the new sheriff in Charleston, new sheriff in Washington. At, what are we what are you doing addressing the test scores among the kids there's been talk about different tests there's been talk about what what's the plan to ri- to rise the raise the test scores yeah no, i'm not sure i'm not sure i understand what you mean by different tests there may be some other some people have said that the testing is just inherently unfair because it's based on the sats as opposed to oh sure you know. yeah so um, we have an accountability system in place that we have to adhere to um, and I do think that the accountability system we have now has greater flexibility than it had, you know, five or six years ago. Um, I do think that there's other, other things that I would like to see as a, as a school leader that, that are given, especially around high school assessment. You know, you have the SAT, but, you know, we have students that take the ASVAB. We have students that take the NOCTI test. And, and I think that having um, different assessments for different pathways of students that are on their way to the graduation stage, I think are very important. Um, I also think that when we talk about a one time, one moment in time assessment, it isn't always a fair representation of what students need to be able to, you know, what students know. So I think multiple opportunities to assess students' skill is, is important. Uh, thinking about the new sheriff in town, uh, what I will tell you is, is that the platforms that I'm aware of, um, um, we're, we're going to focus on, we're going to focus on educating kids. We're going to focus on supporting our educators. We're going to be focused on high quality professional development that is research based. We are going to make sure that in Berkeley County, that the curriculum and the standards that are required to be taught are being taught. Um, just yesterday, you know, my, my leadership team and I, we did a, um, an instructional walkthrough at Martinsburg high school. I was very pleased with what I was able to see going on in our classrooms. And, uh, but with that comes accountability. You know, we're, we're monitoring what we expect, and that's really important. Dr. Sachs, thank you so much for dropping by today. Thank you. Good As to always. see you again. Dr. Ryan Sachs, Superintendent of Schools in Berkeley County.